So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, imaging of 3D flow phenomena in cement-based materials using X-ray and electrical capacitance tomography. And I'm going to describe what electrical capacitance tomography, or I'm going to use ECT for it, is in a second. Before going forward, I would like to say that this has been a collaboration between uh, multiple researchers from three universities, University of Eastern Finland, Imperial College London, and NC State, where I reside at. Now, there are quite a few people who have collaborated, uh, who has contributed to this work. Petri uh, is a PhD student in the University of Eastern Finland who has taken a lot of beating for this work. Antti is a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Eastern Finland that he has significantly uh, con uh, contributed both to the computational and experimental part of the work. Uh, my friend and collaborator, Aku Seppanen, uh, he is a professor in the University of Eastern Finland, and he, ha he, he has been leading the computational aspect of this work, uh, both with regard to ECT and X-ray. Uh, Marco is another professor at the University of Eastern Finland. He is uh, he's an expert in electrical capacitance tomography, and he'll pose inverse problems, of course, uh, that we have been fortunate to work with him. Uh, Ronnie Pini, he is, uh, he is in Imperial College London, and he is a collaborator of us. He is uh, an expert in reactive flow in porous media. Uh, Hayam Hosseini, who is a PhD student of mine at NC State, who has contributed significantly to the experimental part of this work. Um, and finally, me. I just wanted to make sure that you know how I look, how I look since my camera is off. Uh, so there wouldn't be any questions in future. Now, why do we do imaging? Imaging is useful because it provides intuition. It provides, it's, it provides imagination that we can see. We are visually oriented people, um, and we would like to see what is happening inside the material, and imaging is an excellent way to do that. Uh, imaging also makes explanation of very complex phenomena easy. When we see them, we can now put two and two together and explain what is happening. But imaging is especially useful when we use quantitative, when we can get or extract quantitative information off of it. And that is very important. That is one of the things that I'm going to talk about today with regard to ECT or electrical capacitance tomography. And imaging is, of course, very useful when we are observing very complex phenomena that we can wrap our head around it and talk uh, uh, and, and explain it in much more detail. So let me get the laser pointer over here. All right. So the first part of this talk, I will be talking about estimating transport properties using electrical capacitance tomography, or ECT. Now the question is, what is ECT? ECT, uh, in ECT, basically, we are reconstructing a three-dimensional image of the permittivity distribution inside an object. We are trying to indirectly estimate how the permittivity is distributed. It's a non-destructive method, and the advantage of that over X-ray and neutron is that we can apply this to large samples. We have applied this to uh, samples of 4 by 8 or 6 by 12, and you can get very nice results from it which can be very challenging when you're using X-ray or neutron tomography. Now, ECT uh, is ideal when we, are talk, uh, when we are dealing with samples with a very low moisture content or very low electrical resistance. Uh, for those of you who know me, I have been spending a lot of uh, past, a lot, uh, major portion of the past 10 years worrying about ERT, electrical resistance tomography, when that is very suitable for samples that have a high moisture content. But today, we're going to talk about ECT. Now, ECT is an inverse problem, and I'm going to talk about the inverse problem in this sense using a very simple parallel plate. Now, we know that um, capacitance of a capacitor or the accumulated charge in a capacitor with a known capacitance is related to the potential difference that we put across of it. And also, the capacitance is related to geometry, the area, and I'm talking about the pa uh, parallel plate capacitor, distance between the two electrodes, and of course, relative permittivity of the material in between. And this one is a vacuum permittivity. And of course, if we put these two equations together, we get to this equation. And in the simple term, this equation tells us 
that if we know how much, put, how much potential we are putting across a plate of a capacitor, if we know the dimensions of that, and we know the relative permittivity of the material in between, we can estimate the amount of charge that will accumulate on the electrodes. This is a forward problem. If I know delta V, if I know A and D and epsilon R, what is Q? Now, what we are doing is we are solving this problem in an inverse mode. We are saying, if I measure the amount of Q for a given delta V, and I have some information about the geometry, can I estimate the relative, the relative permittivity? And the idea is that when water uh, happens to move through concrete, that relative permittivity will change, and therefore I can say where the water is. All right, that is all good, but parallel plate is not very useful for us, and we need to deal with more complex geometries. In this case, I'm gonna be talking about cylindrical geometry. We have to deal with cylindrical geometry. In this case, two electrodes will not do, and we need more number of electrodes. The idea is very similar to the parallel plate capacitor. We are putting multiple plates or electrodes around this object, we are charging them, we are putting a delta V potential difference across a pair of them, and we are measuring how much charge accumulates on the surface of those two electrodes. Then we're gonna switch to the next pair of electrodes. We repeat that process, we put a delta V, we measure how much charge we put it, and we go around this object and repeat this multiple times. Well, uh, we have a difficulty here because now we cannot use the geometry of a parallel plate electrodes and we have to go and use some computational method. In this case, we have to use a forward model. In this forward model, of course, this is nothing but diffusion equation and we need to have boundary conditions. I'm not gonna go into the detail of all of this because it will t I can talk about this for probably half a day if I wanted to, but uh, the idea is that now we know that uh, the, the potential on the electrode is related to some sort of contact impedance, let's say. We know that the charge accumulates on the electrodes is related to potential difference, and we have no flux boundary condition when there is no electrode. And then we have to go ahead, and uh, of course, in this case, we have to use a computational method. We have to discretize uh, our domain, we use some, uh, we use a finite element method for that. And then we have to basically minimize the error and the N over here error. So estimating the permittivity distribution inside this object translates into a minimization problem. Now, this minimization problem turns out to be a little bit tricky it turns out to be an Ilpo's inverse problem, nonlinear inverse problem. So we have to have some sort of regularization strategy to make sure that what we get is realistic or in a Bayesian framework, we can interpret that as putting input parameters into this. Now this was a, 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 a prior information into the solution. Now this was a very brief overview, uh, overview of how this method worked, but let's look at an example. On the left, you see an image of a concrete material with a PVC pipe glued on it, and the electrodes are underneath this copper plate that it is there for shielding and avoiding electromagnetic interference, and water penetrates into the concrete, and we are measuring this as a function of time. Now you can see mortar material with three different water cement ratio, 0 0.36, 0 0.42, and 0 0.55. And these are the time that shows uh, that, that the times that the measurements have been taken. And you can see that this plume is basically moving throughout this material and we can, very, uh, we can see it, we can visualize it, and this is very nice. Now in the next slide over here, well, I think I had a video on this. I guess that this would be the case. Let me see if I can get this working, okay. So we have water cement ratio 0.36 and water cement ratio 0.55. This is a basically uh, animation from all the measurements that have been done. Of course, these measurements, uh, the, the measurements were done at, a, at one hertz per second, but we have selected a certain number of them to make this animation. And you can see that we can completely visualize this. This is great, but 
it will be a lot more useful if we can actually extract some more information off of this and how we do that. To extract more information from this, first we work with a simpler geometry. In this case, we are exposing the entire surface of the cylinder. Okay, laser pointer here. The entire surface of the cylinder to water and water is penetrating through the material. So we have a one dimensional flow. Again, we have three different water cement ratio, water cement ratio 0.55. 0.42 and 0.36 and you can see as a function of time it penetrates a uh, different depth in inside the material uh, can everyone hear me because I'm getting some sort of uh, delay on my computer can one person confirm that you can hear me I can yes. hear you mom it is broken okay thank you all right so let's continue so we can see that we can, uh, we can have a one-dimensional flow throughout the material. And the beauty of one-dimensional flow is that now we can do certain assumption and extract some more information off of this experiment that we wouldn't be able to do that, for example, with simple sorption experiment. Now let's look at over here on the plot on the left. These on top, you can just see the, the previous images. On the, on, the, uh, on the plot on the left, this is for water cement ratio 0.3. These show the basically the distribution of relative permittivity as a function of distance throughout the, the length of, you can consider that x-axis be the z-axis moving downward. And at a different time, you can see that, that very smooth, nice, uh, distribution of permittivity throughout the material and of course we can choose a certain uh, we can choose for example at the, at the half point uh, of these as a as a location of water front and then we can plot them at the square root of time and uh, without again going to the too much detail we can use this information with another theory in this case we are using sharp front theory and from this we can extract the information, uh, more information, more quantitative information. And what we have done over here is that we use this information to extract saturated hydraulic conductivity. I generally would like to use the term saturated hydraulic conductivity as opposed to permeability because permeability have been a little bit tricky sometimes. And sometimes we talk about chloride permeability and so forth and and uh, i would like to call the saturated hydraulic conductivity this is permeability that we are measuring using darcy and flow and now if we go through this practice and estimate the saturated hydraulic conductivity or darcy and permeability uh, for different type of material and we actually use darcy and measurement over here that we have a column of water that's moving through the sample and we are measuring using a transducer, pressure transducer. We are measuring the height of this column using a transducer that just automates it. We can measure that and compare these to the estimate that we got from ECT. And you can see that we get a very, very good relate correlation between the estimates from uh, electrical capacitance tomography, ECT, and the Darcy flow. So that was the first part of this presentation. And the second part, which is a shorter part, don't worry, uh, I will talk about the imaging reactive transport in fracture cement paste using X-ray tomography. So here is the image of a sample. This is a dry scanner using X-ray imaging. This is a cement paste. It's a cylinder of two by six, um, uh, two inch diameter, six inch long, cylinder water cement ratio 0.45 it has a little bit of residual moisture at the center you can see over here with a brighter color there are cracks as well and we intentionally crack this we actually put this in an oven and and we impose a thermal cracking on the sample because we wanted to uh, uh we, we wanted to have these cracks during the reactive flow and uh, we started this experiment by injecting co2 in the sample and then we that that was followed by injection of water in, in into the sample here's the experimental setup this is in imperial college london um, the cement paste sample is encapsulated inside this core holder uh, it, it it has a confining pressure around it and the water or co2 supplies at one end and moves out the other end now you can uh, you can have to have uh, multiple different uh, gases if you wanted to 
to flow through this material. This is how the core holder actually looks in person uh, or physically. And uh, we use the medical uh, x-ray uh, that was modified uh, uh, for this experiment. This is in Imperial College London again. All right, moving forward. Now, what I would like to do over here to show you a very brief video. And after that, I'm gonna go into the detail of uh, uh, static images. This is a fractured cement face. Those yellow things that you see around us, this is a result of an algorithm that we have developed to separate the fractures inside the sample. So this is after the dry scan is processed to identify all the fractures that are distributed through. Then we inject this material. Remember that it has a little bit of moisture at the center. We inject this with CO2, and then we stop the CO2 and we inject water. And just watch what happens. Something cool will happen in a second. Now, as soon as we inject CO2 inside of this material, a, sh a carbonate shell forms around, around the core of that material when we have moisture. And after when we inject water through the material, that carbonate shell actually has a low permeability, low porosity, and water has a more difficult time to enter into the core and moves around the sample. Now, here are the images that you can see. This is the original scan of the material. Uh, no, I want a laser pointer. This is original scan, dry scan. We start to inject CO2, and you can see that car calcium carbonate or I should be careful and say carbonate formation is happening. It starts around the tip of the cracks. And the reason that it starts there because you have more, more rapid access to CO2. This carbonate shell starts to form around this core of the material. With injection of CO2, this carbonate shell starts to basically thicken quite a bit. Now, if I go to the next slide, this shows when the water is being injected inside the material. And you can see that the water starts to inject through the cracks and it is moving toward the core of the sample, of course. And not only it is moving through the cracks, you can see that it is getting distributed. It is all, also it is moving inside the cement paste as well. However, the water is not very easily entering into, the, uh, into this uh, carbonate shell. And you can see over here, after some time, the water is starting here. Uh, and when water starts to touch the boundaries of the shell, still it's penetrating through the original material as opposed to the carbonate shell that you can see here. In fact, I have a, uh, a more, even more interesting image over here that, uh, that you can see. Okay. I am having a difficulty with one, one thing. Um, so, uh, uh, Chris or Brokan, do you see the half shell right now? I do. Okay, uh, great. I also do, yeah. Hurry up, so uh, go as quick as you can, Mohammed. Thank you. So this is basically a longitudinal cross-section that you can see that the water is penetrating inside the material till later times you can see is actually water is moving, uh, moving inside, inside the material. In fact, we are so excited about this result that we have started a startup company that you can submit an image of your friend, your loved ones, and we can make a carbon shell inside the concrete for you. And uh, you won't be able to see it, of course. Uh, uh, that was a joke, by the way. Uh, anyways, so he, these are my concluding remarks. Of course, ECT has been used over here to estimate the saturated hydraulic conductivity. We have seen the reactive flow inside the cementitious material and crack healing as well as reduction in porosity that impedes the moisture flow inside the material. Uh, this, uh, the, the, this research, of course, has been uh, a collaboration and we would like to also acknowledge the, 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 our sponsor, the Science for Clean Energy. With that, I will end my presentation here.